Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Casey Morell. Every year, the Missouri School of Journalism bestows an award for journalists and media professionals who have shown exemplary service to the craft of journalism. The Missouri Honor Medal has been awarded since 1930, and past recipients include people like CNN's Christian Amanpour, the public television series Frontline, writer and author Gloria Steinem, and NBC's Tom Brokaw. On today's program, we're lucky to be joined by one of 2014's winners, Eugene Richards. He's a documentarian and photographer whose depictions of people and the lives that they lead have earned praise throughout his more than 40-year career. And Eugene, thank you so much for joining us today on Global Journalist. Nice to be here. So what is it about photography as a medium that appeals to you? What is it that sets it apart for you in your eyes? God, I was thinking we would go to back to the beginning because I've always been wondering more what drew me in mm -hmm. to photography. I think the um, I think what drew me in was a very different thing. I think it was the the independence. I might have grew up in the age of cowboy movies or whatever <laughs> that, that, that we journalists seem to to be drawn to, and the idea of a life where you could be on your own. And um, I tried to uh, go into. Uh, print journalism, work for small new newspapers, and I realized I didn't belong behind the desk, so uh, on I went into the world. And uh, so I, my beginnings were down as following my years as a VISTA volunteer. Um, and right immediately I realized that I was trying to photograph conditions of poverty in the Delta because I was pushed in that direction. I didn't have any great drive to do so. And the response of the photos was very powerful. We were raised, raised money for our organization and so forth. And uh, so I never really, a lot of, like a lot of people, I never was driven to go in that direction. It happened. And once I was in the direction, it kept, it kept going. Now, when you set out to take a photograph of a person or a place or what have you, do you already have the, fin the finished product in your mind when you go to look behind the camera, or is it something that just comes to you when you're there? Oh, I always do. I, I, I'm full of biases. That's what I call them, total biases. I, I seem to think that I'm going to know the person, that I have this great innate skill to be able to look at you and, and to know something about you, and I'm usually wrong, <laughs> and uh, quite profoundly and, uh, at times. Uh, and that's what makes it wonderful about using the camera. Um, and the word veracity is not the favorite word today because we question the veracity of so much of what we're seeing and so much of what we're hearing. But that's been a driving force is to be there and actually try to capture with the camera what they're really like versus the way you'd like them to be. And um, it, it, it's a struggle, but that's the, the ultimate point. Have you found that when you go to take pictures of people that they act a certain way or you feel as though they're acting in a certain way that's not natural at the beginning until they're used to you being there? Uh, well, I began, like I said, photographing in the South and the Arkansas Delta, and there, the people who let you photograph them uh, felt that they, were in, a, in a way, was a gift. You were there, you offered you a gift, and very often they would ask you, turn, turn to you after you took the first picture, should I stay here? Should I not move? Should I do this, do that? Um, and so there was a there was an artificiality about the photographs. Even the ones that looked they looked great, but they're not real. Um, it took quite a long time for me to develop the skills of personality and and distance, to, so that people could start being them totally themselves. What do you mean by that? That you said that they weren't real? Is that that they were? staged in some way? They were conscious of me. They were uh, um, conscious of me and wanting to please. Uh, they had no idea because these were people at that time with not much education. These were sharecroppers, so they, they, so they weren't even media savvy, but their job was to please. And, um, and that's happened to me quite a few times. What, what would you like me to do? How would you like me to, to look? You go up to Appalachia, for example, uh, and you get the invitation into somebody's house, and people are used to how people in Appalachia are portrayed, and they'll actually bring on the pose. I've had people actually go, would you like me to look this way? They'll bring their family out, and they'll look like 
the media perspective of what a poor Appalachian family is like. Behind that, is a, in, inside of the house and in their worlds, is a very different world. Why do you think it is that they put on airs or put on an appearance for the sake of the camera? Is it because they think that's what you want? They think it's what it's, they want, and they also want it to be quick. Um, they want the, uh, the camera, something they're not used to. Um, more and more people are used to it now, but even now, as you know, with the, the, the selfies and the, the constant uh, cell phones in our hands, people are even becoming more performance-oriented. But then, when I started, they were doing me a favor. Do you see, then, your role as a photographer as being one that's in the background, meant more to be an observant than a participant in whatever it is that you're looking at? T totally. I think there's no way, I mean, there's no illusion that you are there with a camera, you're entering somebody's life, you're altering it in the sense that you're there. But if, the, in my life, the photographs that I feel that worked and the way that they're supposed to work, that when they, people more or less forget me, um, or, or tolerate me, or find it amusing I'm there, and then just simply go back to who they are as much as possible, yeah. How do you decide what topics or what types of people that you want to photograph or to film? Is there an idea that gets into your head that says, you know, for example, with Cocaine Blue, that you want to examine what drug users look like, or is it something that just, I guess what I'm getting at, is it more premeditated, or is it a spur of the moment type of thing? Um, if I had to look at the whole career, I'm a, I'm a working journalist. It's my profession. It's my job. And I'm an assignment photographer. I have a tendency to take the initial assignment and go, keep going with it. But the most everything starts off as an assignment. The drug work, for example, began with hearing about violences in Detroit when out there. Uh, in that case, it was awful. It was. Um, going to a morgue and finding little boys in the morgue and no one knew, nobody claimed them, nobody, and where did they come from? It turned out they came from, ironically, not far from where I was working as a social worker in the South. Drug gangs would go down to Marianne, Arkansas, or whatever it is, pick up these little boys who were attracted to the lifestyle, bring them back to Detroit where they would function as drug runners and then they would dispose of them when they got to be of school age. So they'd be, um, and suddenly there was this mystery here. And then my own neighborhood in Brooklyn, where I was living, was becoming more violent. So I got an, an assignment. We asked for it in this case. Could we, could we go out in the world and see what we could do that, to delve a little bit deeper? I wasn't sure that could even be done, to be honest, but you kind of go. Um, that was a case where I pushed the assignment. But most of them are, are indeed that, they're, they're assignments. In that case, I started off in one place and ended to be a couple of years of various places before I could do the book I wanted to do. How does seeing those images shape your experience? Obviously, you see them once as an active observer and what's going on, but then when you take the photograph, it's almost as though those memories and that experience can come back to you at any time. How does that duality shape your work? I'm not sure if I grasp that question. So when you, for example, the conversation that we're having, obviously, right. if you look back on it, you'll remember it. But if okay. you see a photograph of it, you know, or if you took a photograph of us talking and you look at that, how does that sense of history, I guess, play into what you do later on, if it does at all? Well, when I look at my photographs afterwards, I usually find them quite deficient, and it's not any kind of humility. I really feel that way. I think that they, um, because by that time, I've worked hard to get into somebody's life. I make the pictures, there's usually not a whole lot of them, and, and I recognize very quickly that that picture was a fragment of the life. And almost inevitably, I know the people beyond that fragment, beyond the pictures. And so I look at them, and, and a lot of times my photographs make me uncomfortable, and uh, for that very reason, that I think they're accurate to but a moment. Um, I've kept very close to huge numbers of the subjects, and we, we discussed that a little bit. And no, no one has ever said to me, astonishingly, that this was not right. But we do acknowledge that it wasn't everything. That it's almost the, because it's so ephemeral, the fact that it's a, a, a snapshot taken at one point of time, you wish it almost could tell more of a story than it does? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, uh, 
if you're talking about the drug world, you go in and you meet a woman who allows you into her, into her worst moment of addiction. She's, and one woman forgot so much, he needed a drug so badly she had her baby there and was ignoring the baby. You take that photograph. Now, no one's going to know that that woman had been a nurse and she lost her, her job, her profession because of this addiction she couldn't control. They won't see that and they won't see where she went. Uh, in her case, I couldn't find her again. I, um, uh, very often in that world that I was working in, what followed was more tragedy, more death. The death was very common in the drug world. Um, so they, they, were, they, were, they were moments, yeah. You're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Casey Morell. Today we're talking to documentarian and photographer Eugene Richards, who received a 2014 Missouri Honor Medal for services to journalism. For more Global Journalist content, you can always visit us online at globaljournalist.org. While there, you can listen to or watch episodes from our archive, including more conversations with Honor Medal winners, and read in-depth articles on international affairs and free press issues. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. So back to the conversation that we were having. When you're behind the camera and you're looking at the environment around you, mm -hmm. how is it that you know when to push the button to, to make the shutter close? When do you know you have that decisive moment, if you will? It's a curious question because I actually do know when the best photograph is made, or the best, the ones most reflective of what, I'm, what I wanted, I know it. But usually, it's a process of getting there. Like everything, it's like a, like an interview. You you begin in a place. When I interview, you begin with asking somebody about where they came from, moving on to something else, and there might be a surprise in there. Um, photography is that way too. You you're a photographer, so you have to make photographs. I very often use the camera nervously when I start, uh, simply because someone expects me to be taking pictures and you, you stand around with long enough and it'll make you a person a wreck. So you start, <laughs> you start, uh, then they relax a little more, then they become, uh, are, are, are you intruding on something? And, and, and it, it's a waiting process. Um, almost inevitably when that time comes, when, when all the elements come together, uh, more of the emotional elements, um, you know it. You can mess it up technically or, or um, because of nervousness, the camera can shake, but that's the picture that you want. And then what you do afterwards is you continue on because, again, the nerves can, you, you feel like you have to try to get something better. And once in a while that happens, but not usually. Do you think it's something that can be taught, or is it just an instinctive thing that you pick up once you've been practicing the craft for long enough? I think, it's, I think for most of us it's instinctive from the beginning. I think you get, uh, you either have that skill or, or you don't. And I think you, no matter what it is that we, have, that we do, I think you get better at it and able to control it more. But there are people who are tone deaf and you can't, you simply can't <laughs> teach them any other way. You can make them better. You can teach them how to disguise that tone deafness to some degree. But the innate ability to recognize and put these elements together almost seems to be the, a gift that give it to some people have and some people know. And it's kind of cruel to say so, but I think that that's the case. Do you think the fact that pretty much we're at a point where people can carry around a camera with them at all times, mm -hmm. whether it's a point-and-shoot camera or one that's on our, our mobile phone or anything like that, do you think that that enhances photography as a medium, or do you think that it lessens it? Uh, it, it well, obviously it does both. I think it, um, it puts all of our photographs into, this, uh, into these massive multitudes of millions and billions of pictures, so things get to be conglomerate and sticky and uh, lose their separation. On the other hand, the person with a camera is going to bring us back uh, the images that we have seen, the amateurs. I was just reading the night again about the Abu Ghraib photographs, which are probably the most significant set of pictures in some ways of our time, well, contemporary time. And they were, of course, made as, for all reasons, they were, some of them were forensic pictures, some of them were just people being rude <laughs> to other, other ones. I think that's going to keep immersing uh, more and more um, 
human experience that we wouldn't have seen are going to, and they keep coming out. What we're going to do with them, I have no idea. It, it, it engenders all these questions about what right do each of us have to privacy, other things that we should see. We've always had these questions, should see, shouldn't see. What's going to happen when we see more and more? Are they going to make us more and more insensitive to each other than we already are? So it, they're, they're massive. They're, they're the questions of our time. Do you think it's going to lead to, or has it already led to, more of an acceptance of being photographed or having our memories, uh, I guess, perceived in such a way that we rely more on a photograph that we take at an event or a photograph of people together doing something than the actual memory itself? It's curious. I'm finding people, in, I don't know, it, if it's a cell phone, it happens, it's nothing to do with the cell phone. But my world that I work in is becoming much more difficult. I think that the, uh, uh, and it's, it's a fear. It's in this country, and I think it may, you know, there's, there's somehow, whatever's going on with us, we're getting more afraid of each other and um, uh, more cautious about each other. Um, whether they think because they see so many cell pictures of people making fools out of another person or are violating their right to privacy or are saying that somehow or other with an image you can label the sexuality of a person. Uh, uh, whatever's happening, people are becoming much more suspicious of the camera and it's making it harder to enter into lives in an intimate fashion. At least that's my experience. Do you think that that is only going to get worse as, as the cameras on phones, for instance, and other mobile devices become better and better? The, the two ways. I mean, the, the practitioners of that mobile phone could start to use it in a, in a different way. Instead of in a foolish way or a, a joking way, it could be the tool because of the, it's not something you take seriously. I carry around this big machine when I'm photographing sometimes, and you take, it's obviously you're serious. So it could turn around into something kind of remarkable and sensitive, or it could turn out to be a monster, uh, you know, where, um, I mean, I find myself turning away from cell phones now. Um, in a curious, I find them, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of irritating. They're irritating me in a lot of ways. I, I want privacy. I want, we each, each of us, human beings, need quiet time, and they're everywhere. Do you think that some of the photos that you took, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you'd be able to take now, given the skepticism toward the camera? Yeah, I don't think we're there yet. I mean, I think the individual can go out there and still, through a process and being careful and doing their own studies of who they are, and what the, I think you could still move into that world. But the suspicions are very there. For example, photographing children. Uh, I'd say 20 years ago, everybody photographed children. There was the joy of being a child on the street. You could, and people saw that with the camera and they knew what you were doing, perhaps. Today, if you bring the camera around, around children, uh, people run over. It's happened to me recently. I was photographing kids in a park. Um, and the teachers came over and pulled them away because they would suspect, you know, and maybe it's the age that I am, but I think a, a man of any age, they're suspecting that there's something else there. Um, so it's going to, you know, and sometimes there is, sometimes there's not. You're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Casey Morell. On today's program, we're talking to documentarian and photographer Eugene Richards, who received a 2014 Missouri Honor Medal for services to journalism. For more Global Journalist content, you can always visit us online at globaljournalist.org. When you're there, you can listen to or watch episodes from our archive, including more conversations with Honor Medal winners, and read in-depth articles on international affairs and free press issues. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. When you go out to take photographs, do you still shoot on film? No, it's, I mean, um, it's digital. When did that change happen for you? Uh, the last project I did on film was a book called War is Personal, which was the work that I did in the returning uh, on the consequences of the Iraq war. And it was 15 stories and I was shooting film. And then after that, the more and more I, I wanted to get back into the magazine world, and it's expected that you produce digital. It's a great uh, uh, money saver, 
for the institutions we're working for, and I think that's a primary goal of surviving, and digital is cheaper. Um, of course, digital, and the next question would be, how does it affect you? And then, of course, it's, to me, it's a massive mess, <laughs> digital. It's, I'm getting terrible habits. All the habits that I, I learned when I was coming up was to be frugal, careful, uh, not to shoot many pictures and know that moment that we were discussing. Mm -hmm. when, and now with a digital camera, it's infinite. You can just push that button down and inf in images emerge. You're always dissatisfied. You're always reviewing yourself on the back of the camera. You become kind of self-conscious. Um, and ultimately, if you look at the pictures that are out there, they're becoming more and more, sometimes extraordinarily beautiful, but uh, more design element, uh, more design e because um, we're always looking to push the envelope a little farther. So the pressures on us because of the digital age are pretty heavy. Do you think that some of that design element comes from a desire, not necessarily from journalists, but from people shooting on digital, to think that they can correct things in post, whether it's through Photoshop mm -hmm. or other ways like that? I think it begins in the camera itself. I think we're always trying to... Uh, um, it depends on your intent. Um, I think that's the question we all have now is, is photojournalists, is what is your intent? Um, if your intent is to try to uh, reveal the nature of a person out or a situation, then things won't change. If your intent is to make a photograph that's provocative, that pushes, pull, pushes you in to pay attention to that situation, then the game is different. And I think that 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 is, the photographs are becoming more provocative visually. Um, and if you can't do it in the camera, then you can do it later. I mean, one of the the great you, you only have to look at uh, at pictures today of the depth of shadows, the the drama, the skies that didn't quite ever exist. I mean, uh, the drama of everybody's skies. Um, uh, so the question is where, you know, we got massive questions of where to draw the line um, and whether we should. If you're shooting something for an outside project and you see that what you've sent to them and what ends up getting published are two different things, either through manipulation of some sort or editing or cropping, do you get frustrated with that? Do you get upset with it? Is there a certain line that you think, you know, above that everything is not good, but there's some wiggle room there? I have no illusion. I mean, first, first of all, you're hired by somebody. You're doing it. there's limitations. No matter, you know the magazine that you're being hired by. You know what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. That doesn't mean that you're going to be happy about it. That doesn't mean that you're not going to fight about it. And then you, it's the pressures of our business. Is how far can you fight? Um, we get reputations. I've got one. I'm not terribly overt. Is is is. It's kind of a bad reputation in some ways because I have a tendency to make my own photographs and make it some, somewhat difficult for the editors. Um, that's what they tell me. How so? How, how do they think that you're making it difficult for them? It, it's, a, it's a line. There are, um, there's, I think it comes back to how you see, how we all individually see. And, and I grew up I think less on photography than on films, on movies, and there's always a sense in a in, in a film that there's a before and an after. Um, there are always these great single images that we might remember or not, but but photography to me is that way too. So the photographs that I feel comfortable with are the ones that are momentary, that are uh, very clearly that that are in motion. Uh, most magazines now have an idea to illustrate, um, and they want them to be as direct as possible, um, so that you look at them right away and understand what the meaning, what your intent was. My uh, idea of a photograph is something that makes you wonder what the intent is <laughs> and what's going on here. Um, but they want, uh, you know, and I think it's moving more and more that way. I think we're more and more becoming illustrators of ideas. Would you say that your approach then for 
taking photographs differs from that of filmmaking? When, if, if you're doing one or the other, do you go about them in the same way, or what differences would exist between them for you? Oh, oh well, the, the difference is enormous, of course. The, when you're filming, you're, there's always the, and the camera's up to your head, there's always another moment. There, there's a redemptive moment that you can, you can not work here in a few moments. Like, I mean, only, language is more now. Language, when you're making films, is, is the problem. How so? Um, language is not to be repeated. Great language, great conversations, great moments. I, I, um, uh, when you're filming them and something is re revealed to you uh, through language and your visual is way off, you're, there's nothing you can do about it. And it came to me, I, I did a small film on a man that I met by accident who I never would have read that he was a former head of the Ku Klux Klan in Missouri. And he invited me to his home and I didn't know his history. He was um, at the end of his life, he knew it, of COPD and other respiratory illnesses. And he, for some reason, I can't go into it, wanted to confess her in some ways with her and he wanted to tell what he did and he told me. Um, I'm sitting with the camera, and it's it's not a very dramatic situation. He's laying on a bed. The only drama, drama is you look up, if you cast your eye to the side, there's a big swastika hanging there in bright red, which you try not to look at because it's such a disturbing image. And you're looking at this man who's rather fearsome looking but sad, and you hear the words out of his mouth, and they have nothing to do with the visual image. I mean, he just, and you wish that they did, that there was some... But the language there took precedent, and um, and that's what I always happens to me when I film is is, is the, the visuals are less important than the language, and it's a different thing than uh, than I'm out there with a photograph arm and trying to find the, you know, I'm waiting for that uh, metaphor. And then to close, what advice would you have for anybody who is interested in going into photojournalism and pursuing it as a career? Today, whether I like it or not, it would have to be, and well, number one is don't be forced into it. Um, there's a great movement now to take, to make us all believe that because you're a fine photographer, you can be a fine video videographer, you can be a fine writer, and we all know that these are each wonders within themselves, and, and yet they want us to be multifaceted. On the other hand, to make a living, you're going to have to be able to do all these things. So you're always going to be conflicted. Uh, but um, if I was going to begin again, I would, um, I would have gotten the habit of consistently writing more all the time, as much as I can, once the camera is put down. And I would very much uh, learn as much as I could about filmmaking. You have to be a the future person is going to have to have be multidimensional. There's absolutely no choice if you're going to, if you have to make a living. Eugene Richards, thank you so much for joining us. That's all for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Our thanks again to Eugene Richards for joining us. Our lead producer this week is Nassim Ben Shabane. Travis McMillan from RJI is our technical director, and Jason McClure is our managing editor. For all of us at Global Journalist, thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next time.